Uh, my name is Mark Booth. Uh, I'm an editor at uh, Hodders uh, and uh, and Gordon Smith. Of course, is one of uh, is one of my greatest, if not the greatest, well, author on my list. <laughs> <laughs> it's the correct thing to say. <laughs> And, um, uh, well, thank you for delivering such a brilliant script. I think it's oh, absolutely I, wonderful. I loved writing this book. It was something that just fascinated me to go through history yes. um, and look at some of these great mediums uh, of the past yes. um, and, and be able to bring their work into the modern day and let people see yes. that there were genuine mediums out there working. Yeah. Well, well, one of the things we're going to be doing today, well, the main thing is that having read this brilliant script, um, uh, there are parts I wanted to know more about yeah. and wondered if we, if we could expand on them. And yes. so we're widening the circle yeah. here and then there'll be a subsequent stage where, where that's included and the, and the circle will be narrowed again. Um, but we were, having, we were having a talk last night about what this book yeah. actually is and because uh, it originally started the yeah. original idea was a sort of uh, history of spiritualism wasn't yes. it? and then we, as we were talking about it last night we thought well no that, that isn't really no. precisely what it is no because um, a lot of the claims um, of skeptics uh, talking against mediums is that they give general information they do cold reading reading body language and stuff and I wanted to sort of research and show that there is evidence, actual evidence, to prove that some of these mediums, especially during the Second World War or First World War, they were really at their height and the work they did was very important. Mm -hmm. So many people were in a desperate situation, not knowing if their sons and husbands were you know, still alive. Yeah. And these mediums were able to give them information about them, whether they had passed or not. But there was a healing comfort that came. And, and that's something that I really felt was so important. And it wasn't just general chit-chat or nonsense. They were actually coming up with such specifics mm -hmm. that you had to believe that something supernatural was happening. Yeah. This was not the norm. Yeah. You know, in, in cases where it was Mrs. Helen Hughes, who literally, you know, she probably gave thousands and thousands of messages during the war to mothers and sisters and wives and, and it was the specifics that actually shocked them mm. but the message that she gave them was that the consciousness of these loved ones hadn't gone that somewhere there was a life force that was intelligent yes. that was able to give exact information and detail you know of their life their connection and so on and so forth and i suppose that if you are the recipient of that yeah very precise information um, uh, from beyond the grave, as it were. That's going to convince you as an individual. But I suppose that that people who haven't had that, yeah. uh, particularly skeptics, yeah. their criticism um, of mediumship and uh, psychic abilities and spiritualism mm. would be uh, that these supposed supernatural yeah. phenomena. Uh, are not capable of being proved to be true yeah. using the standards of science. And yet there are many, um, many different kind of tests done by scientists. Yes. The, the, the most obvious that comes to me was when Sir William Crookes, the physicist, yes. um, was asked to investigate the mediumship of Daniel Dunglass Hume. Yes. And Crookes went there prepared basically to uncover some kind of skullduggery that Hume would have gadgets and gimmicks that he would use to create levitations and all this. Um, and actually his findings, which were published as a science paper, yes. showed that he actually believed everything he saw and found no way that the man was actually using trickery. Yes, so, and he was one of the leading scientists of the day. He was a leading light of his time, uh, yeah. Crookes, uh, in the world of physics. And he would have been no idiot. And this is what I'm trying to show that there is documentation out there that proves yes. that certain scientific tests were carried out on certain mediums and, and these mediums passed the test. And we'll come to it later, you've also uh, submitted to scientific testing at Glasgow University which is also going to be in the book. But I suppose when, when we were thinking about titles, yeah. 
um, uh, last night, a title came up. Yeah. Beyond um, Reasonable Doubt. Beyond Reasonable Doubt. <laughs> and, and that's a great title because this book is about evidence. Yes. Um, and, and I've found, you know, writing, say, maybe about the medium Albert Best, who was a personal friend of mine, mm. uh, much older than me. But the stuff that I've used on Albert's mediumship comes from a Church of Scotland minister, yeah. uh, Reverend Kennedy, yeah. who was so blown away by the evidence that Albert gave. The proof that his wife, who had died, was still communicating with him. Yes. And even to the point that she was, she would come to Albert, talk to Albert, and he would phone the husband and say, your wife's here. <laughs> and Albert was getting fed up with this. <laughs> he says, this woman's here again. <laughs> and she wants to, and, and the man would say, well, if she's really there, can you tell me what I'm wearing? And he'd say, hold on, missus, what's your husband wearing? <laughs> and, you know, everything would be correct. Yes. And, and, and Kennedy was so moved because his wife died fairly young and, and he was really, really grief-stricken. And this man, and a couple of other good mediums, really healed the man. So for him to come from his Church of Scotland background, where he was very staunch against this, he ended up into psychical research and looking into the work of mediums. Yes. And Albert passed that test. So I'm using his testimony, not my knowledge of Albert Best. Yes. So. Well, and I, and I think... Testimony, that's a very interesting word in this context, and that's a wonderful story in the book, by the way. But it's testimony, yes, we're using, we, we think we've probably decided to use that title because we are saying that apart from scientific criteria, yeah. there are other ways in which we uh, decide uh, that we can be justified in believing in something. Yeah. And one of them is the test of a court of law. Yeah. And well, so I, we, I think we both think that yeah. many of the cases in this book... Would stand up to would, scrutiny. Yes. In fact, one of the, one of the uh, reasons that I started this book um, was I wanted to put some of these mediums on trial. And I happened to sit down one day at a workshop I was taking in London. And there was a woman sat next to me, and she says, you look a bit concerned. What are you, what are you thinking about? And I said, oh, I said, I need to find a lawyer who can actually help me do, you know, ex excerpts from this book and different things. And she says, well, I do, I'm a barrister. Mm -hmm. And she says, and then she told me a story that she'd lost her young son, <clears throat> and she had no belief in an afterlife, and many people don't, until they're challenged. And the loss of her son broke her. Um, to the point that she said she would lie fetal under the table in her house. She couldn't come out. And it was a, a friend of hers took her to a medium. And on meeting this medium, the man said, you're too broken. He said, I, I'm not going to do a reading for you. Which I thought was quite credible of him. You know, because he saw the woman was just in no state. But he said, I'm going to put something on. And he put on a video, she said. And it was me. And it was a video of me giving a reading. And he said, I want you to try and understand this. Can you see what's happening? And she said... Is this real? And, and then the medium proceeded to tell her, you will meet this man and you will work on a book with him. Mm. I had no idea of this. I'd never met the woman. And when I took, I, I told her I needed a lawyer and she said, well, I've actually been told I'm going to write a part of a book with you. So as we discussed, it would be lovely to get Maria's testimony yes. as an introduction because she looks at mediums as a lawyer and she is really, really, you know, skilled in watching people who tell lies yes. or who, who fudge things. So I think for her to put her introduction to this would, would also show people that it's not just the ordinary housewife who, who goes to see these mediums. There's very intelligent people come along and, and believe it. More than believe it, they actually know it after a while when they've mm. had some absolutely fabulous proof. Yes. Um. Well, uh, spiritualism started in the in the early mid nineteenth century, yeah. but um, but we're really we're talking a bit something a bit wider than that, which is other ways I of knowing, so. ways which are beyond the senses yeah. of human reason, and that of course has been that was <laughs> that predates uh, spiritualism. Well, yeah, I, I mean, modern spiritualism is the term that I mean really is associated with the Fox sisters and. Mm -hmm. in America, uh, 1848, I think, and the two girls would sit and there would be rapping sounds on the table and they yes. would click their fingers and ask the sounds to repeat. So this was probably the first form of spirit communication like that. No, it wasn't the first time it happened, 
but it was seen as a, as a spiritualist yes. type thing. And spiritualism was born out of that. Because there have been, I mean, if you go back to Roman times, the, yeah. I think Pliny, the uh, Roman geographer, yeah. describes events in a, in a Roman house which are exactly Nobody like the pulse of the guys at Enfield or whatever. Yeah. So it's that, those, those wrappings, yeah. that's a universal phenomenon. It is, and it, it's and not only, you know, it doesn't really begin in Hydesville in 1848. Mm -hmm. There have been many occasions when people did hear wrappings in houses and so on and so forth. And why, so why, why, this, why did this one become so significant? Well, I, I think the Fox Sisters one became significant um, because there was something happening, and, and my view of spiritualism, having read as many kind of historical books on it as I can, I've seen it that spiritualism actually was born for a reason, for a bigger reason than, than people knew. Mm -hmm. And to me, the, the sense was this higher power, or source of consciousness, is aware that there's going to be people dying in mass in the world, yes. we, we come, wars that are coming up, that this higher knowledge would have. Yes. access to future events, that spiritualism itself, because when the Fox sisters started, I mean, the whole thing exploded over America. Yes. Everybody was doing these rappings, obviously a lot of them were cheating, yes. and, and it was becoming performance rather than but it, communication. But that was, a, well, that, that was a time of war in America, yeah, wasn't it? So it was. The dead would have been and, crowding and, around, there would have been a lot of grief. And this is it, and, and, and because then at that time, I mean, the world was changing at that time. You know, people were starting to investigate the mind in a different way. It's psychiatry being born and things like that. You know, mm -hmm. physics was changing as well. Yeah. Things like, I mean, I, I'm fascinated that Sir Oliver Lodge, um, the, the, the physicist who, who I think invented the, the components for radio, mm -hmm. that Marconi, yes. these people believed in life after death. Yes. And well, they, Alexander Graham Bell was looking. He was looking to make a machine. Yeah, that's what Thomas so Edison, so, yeah, yeah. Edison. And again, all of these great minds at the time were, were concentrating on ways that if you can, you know, encourage radio wave to be received and, and, and played back through a machine, couldn't you do the same with other etheric energy, yes. which would be spirit? Yes. So, so when you look at the, the, the level of, of thinkers there, as I say, the, these were the people that actually really created spiritualism as a philosophy, mm. and also even as a science, where, yes. where they looked into it as a science. Well, it was the beginning of a movement, wasn't it? Yeah. To try to look at spirituality in a scientific way. Yeah. And I think people forget about, because spiritualism now, I think to most people, they would, it would seem like a bit of a, Victorian thing. Yeah. Darkened rooms and, you know, yeah. ectoplasm yes. is, the, is the buzzword of the Victorians. <laughs> we'll come back to ectoplasm. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but, 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 but at the time it was fantastically, yeah. it was a fantastically progressive thing. Well, it was. And it was, uh, um, uh, it became very closely entwined with, with socialism. It did, yeah. Uh, I can think of a couple of great socialists who, who were the forerunners for, for modern spiritualism, uh, Gerard Massey, the great poet, yes. who, the quotes that that man gave us in spiritualism are so philosophical and beautiful. And, and, and he was a, a passionate socialist. Uh, and, and of course, Robert, uh, Robert Owen, uh, the founder of the, the cooperative yeah. Yeah. Uh, thing, uh, movement. He, he was another socialist, wasn't he? Yes, yeah, yeah. But these people all lent their name to spiritualism in those days. Yes, and uh, yeah, prime ministers. And Queen Victoria. Yes, I mean Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, uh, I mean the, 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 the talk is that John Brown was a medium. John Brown was actually a medium. Was he? He was a spiritualist. Yeah. And they, there was criticism that he was encouraging the Queen to look into spiritualism. But the word in the spiritualist circles at that time, Brown was actually doing seances for the Queen. It was said. Really. There's no recordings of this, and we can't cite that in the book, no. but. We, you know, this was rumoured, it was very strong that John Brown was basically her companion and medium yes. after her husband died and she needed this, this reassurance that, that through the love they were still connected through mm. this medium. And um, I suppose the Fox sisters had a bit of a checkered story though, didn't they? They're, they're not totally credible. <laughs> but one of the things I've used in, in the book, because the one thing we can say about the Fox sisters, whether 
they were genuine to start with, which I believe it was a genuine phenomenon mm. that attracted attention. And I think they changed when they got attention, as can happen mm. all of a sudden, you know. But the one message they gave that, that you have to agree it happened was they, they were told through the, the communication of raps that there was the body of the spirit communicating buried beneath the house. Mm. And when they excavated the, the house, they found a body. Yeah. So, I mean, there was, there was, if that be true, there was intelligent information that could be proved yes. that that did happen. Whatever they did afterwards, I mean, I, I think it became a performance. They became like circus acts. Which, which is a pressure on any anyone, any medium who becomes famous, yeah. I suppose. And then, then they said that they cheated, then they retracted that statement and said that mm. no, they were told to say that they cheated. So they are very checked mm. in that way. But I believe also because mediums were coming out of the woodwork everywhere at that point. And, and it's quite strange that so many mediums all of a sudden came out. You know, they, they were all over. Yes. Europe, the UK, and I said, Daniel Dunglass, whom that I mentioned was probably the most known because of the extremely paranormal phenomena that he created yeah. for his body would levitate. Yeah. And even if you look back to that, to the 1850, 1860, it would have been quite difficult, I suppose, even for a Houdini type person to create some of the, if the you know, some of the yes. phenomena. Because along with this, and this is what makes it different, there would be messages. So it wasn't just phenomena for phenomena's sake. Yes. I think the spirit world at that time was showing that there was more to our world than we know. Yes. That the law of physics itself is something in our reality, but there's another law in, 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 a, in a kind of spiritual sense. But somebody like Hume would give also messages yes. in the middle of this. Again, exact messages to people who had maybe had a loss. And that then said that either that man had a wonderful uh, team of people going around researching, because in order to do this regularly, that's what you would have to have. And as far as I'm aware, Hume did not have, he didn't even have any friends, I don't think, the man, mm. or very few friends. But it would have taken quite a, a, a network to gather information on all these people, yes. thinking that he did it thousands of times. Yes. So, uh, and, and he and, and Hume was uh, never caught cheating, wasn't he? But, 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 but some some mediums who you think were very gifted yeah. were caught cheating. Yes. So it doesn't but it so it doesn't actually mean if no. someone's caught cheating no. that everything they did was a cheat. And again it's the it's it's, it's, it's the social pressure to I perform. would say it's the pressure and, and, and once they've become known, then there is that pressure to perform. And the most famous or infamous medium of all time is Mrs. Helen Duncan mm. and um, we look at again the thousands of, of people willing to support her as a medium when she was arrested in, in Portsmouth. And Can you just give that, could you just remind me of that story? Well he Helen was known as a physical medium, the, the mm. whole ectoplasm and people appearing and so on and so forth and she gave a remarkable seance in Portsmouth um, which to this day, nobody can understand how this happened. Mm. Apparently, the, the young sailor appears in the ectoplasm and addresses his mother and tells her, "We went. I went down today on the barrel. We went down. We sunk." And you know, the mother knew her son was on the HMS barrel. He gave the exact location of where the ship was sunk and how everything that happened, and everyone was killed. And uh, the lady herself tried to get this information from the Admiralty. And they, they had no knowledge that the bottom had sunk at that point. Mm. So if this medium did do that, or through her mediumship this message came, then... Three and there weeks, doesn't seem to be any other way. Well, there doesn't seem to be any other way. I mean, either Helen Duncan had connections to very high up in the Admiralty, mm. who at that time did not know the bottom had sunk anyway. But So that was where we look at the, the, the side of Helen Duncan that was genuine. Mm. And... and well, you know, after she was arrested, thousands of people came out to, to give testimony to say, I'm happy to go to court. In fact, there were so many that the judge had to stop it. Mm. But on the occasion where she was raided, now this is another thing, Helen Duncan was raided by the Admiralty, not the police, because word got out that this lady was giving out 
messages during the war um, to people, and and I think she was seen as a public nuisance. Well, it was a threat to security. Yeah, yeah. So, and also, it, it would, you know, the moral of people was was dropping to hear we've lost a ship. You know, that was something that, that probably the whole propaganda during the war was to not tell the public all these things. Mm. But there was Helen and many other mediums at the same time doing this. But when she was arrested, they said that somebody uh, pulled this muslin or cheesecloth and, and put it into a bag. But they never found it. Right. So what Helen says was she had a burn on her body. She says the ectoplasm was retracted back to her body so quick that apparently she had a burn the size of a saucer in her solar plexus. Mm. Now, she was tried and, and found guilty under the Witchcraft Act of 1735. I actually think they were just trying to get her aside, get rid of this woman, she's giving yeah. these secrets. But there was never anything, they never caught any anybody as an accomplice of that with Helen that time. But she did, for some reason, get put in Holloway prison. Um, well, it's said she held seances most nights for all the inmates. So. <laughs> but she's a character, uh, Helen. And whether she cheated on times, because she was arrested another time in Edinburgh for the same thing. So whether she was actually cheating and, you know, make, make a few bob, because I think she charged a guinea or something right. in those days, which would have been a heck of a lot of money. Yes. So that type of mediumship was maybe frowned upon by the other mediums of the day who wanted to be seen as authentic and genuine. Yes. So somebody like Helen would have probably gotten the nerves doing things like this. Another kind of adjacent form of temptation, um, I, uh, I published a medium about 20 years ago and uh, um, I remember bringing her into the publishing house to meet the sales reps. Yeah. And um, she was absolutely brilliant in many ways. She said to one of the reps, you broke your rear brake light this morning on the left, didn't you? And he had. And there were lots of brilliantly accurate, but actually quite trivial things. Yeah, and, and useless. <laughs> and then <laughs> she also made some, in the book, she made some larger Mm -hmm. about uh, ecological disasters yeah. which didn't come true yeah. and the book stopped selling as a result yeah. but why, do, why, why how can what, she obviously had a gift yeah. she could see things mm. which she knew things in other ways, but yeah. when it came to the big things, she really got it wrong. Why is that? Why would that happen? I think, again, there's a temptation there to make a big statement. And also, if you're writing a book mm. and, and you're wanting publicity and things, you're going to go for the big right. statement. And, and a lot of these mediums do predict doom and gloom, disaster, you know. There's so many I've worked with who predict, you know, tsunamis and... Oh, you mentioned that's Irish. Yeah. Irish, uh, Oh, so many, yeah. The, the lady in, in America, uh, who's, who's now in the spirit world herself, uh, Sylvia Brown, but she would, Sylvia would always give predictions that it was, Mexico's going to disappear under a wave. And when it didn't disappear under a wave, much to the relief of Mexican people. <laughs> but then, you know, she would move on to the next disaster. Yes. And, and this, the thing for Sylvia is she never got any right. I don't believe she did. No. But, you know, because it was, it was making her look... I don't know. It got it, attention. It gets attention. Yeah. yeah. At least she was a seer. And she obviously wasn't. And this lady you're talking about was probably good at these psychic things and, and maybe mm. even getting spirit messages at times. But no, knowing no. the future like that, you would need to, I don't know, either you're born with that gift or, or as a seer, um, where you see futuristic events. Mm. And there are people who can do that. Um, and they're more localised to people's lives, you know, they're not Nostradamus. Because I don't think he was very good as a seer. If I look at him, a lot of his stuff is general and can fit. Most you can make things fit to most of them yes. if you want. Yes. But you know, you, we had a great one in Scotland called the Brown Seer, and he was the one who predicted the the end of the line of the Sutherland family because they put him to death, and they, and he gave he spouted this futuristic prediction as he was burning, mm. and he actually saw the end of the lineage, and it took 
200 years of whatever for it to happen. But everything he said happened. Right. Now, to me, I would say that in that very extreme situation, he's burning. And he's gone into this inner consciousness where he could see small events. But he's seen a timeline. Yes. And the timeline is that family, the Sutherlands, who right at this moment, he's hating. So that kind of energy, that kind of venom would lift his mind into some kind of altered state that would make, maybe make him see down this timeline. Yes. Something like that. But the Bram Seer was a good seer. He yes. saw many, many futuristic events, predicted them, and they came true. So these other ways of seeing, of knowing, have existed forever. From sh oh, yeah. Shamanism, Old Testament prophets, saints. But within that, there is this very specific tradition yeah. which you are a part of, spiritual. I am. Yeah. And it's uh, running through the centre of the uh, Spiritualism, there's something, I know you wouldn't like the phrase, but it's almost uh, an apostolic succession, isn't it? Yeah. It's handed down. And you were recognised by, um, you described him to me earlier today, oh, well, yes. yeah, as, as the yeah. most impressive medium you ever... Oh, Albert, yeah. yeah. Uh, for me, I mean, he, he was a name in spiritualism. And, and in the book, I, I've used Albert because he was very credible, and mm. I witnessed it firsthand. And he was allowed; to, uh, he allowed himself to be tested also mm. by, by Professor Roy. And, and that just means that the man was quite confident in his gift, mm. but also honest enough during tests if it didn't work to say it doesn't work, because that—that's the other side. You shouldn't have to perform because yes. somebody wants you to. Well, has it ever happened to you though, that you've stood up in front of five hundred people and? Nothing's came yet. Through. Mm -hmm. What did you do? I talked to the audience. I, I told them, I said, look, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, but I, I get nothing. Mm. I'm just not tuning in or something's not worked. Mm. And um, yeah, I've done that. And, and many times if I've been doing a one-to-one -one reading. Because yes. sometimes you just can't get the, the frequency. Or it just doesn't work. Mm. But as long as you're honest. But the likes of Albert, I mean, he... Yes, he just said this. More about yeah, well, I mean, he was, he was an Irishman who lost his uh, wife and three children during the war. And um, he really knew what grief was. He knew what loss was. Mm. And, and I think that actually gave him the incentive to want to go and help other people who had suffered the same type of loss. But I think it also kept him honest mm. because he knew the pain and the importance if you're going to do this work as a medium. You have to have integrity. And he would know what it would feel like if somebody was trying to fudge a message just to, to make him happy or to please him. Because he didn't like that. You couldn't give Albert a message. He wouldn't allow mediums to give him messages. He mm. would say, no, no, please stop that. Mm. And he says, do you not think I, I can feel my own family? Of course I can. I don't need you to tell me. Yes. So he <laughs> said, so you, you were put firmly in your place. I never did try. But um, to see this man who, at, at the end of the war, uh, you know, that's when Albert started to develop his gift. He had his gift. During the war, he, he was shot and wounded, and he, he would lay there with, with the dead uh, and probably would have died. And he, he explained it to me that he heard the voice of his grandmother shouting to him, Albert, get up, get up. Mm -hmm. And this voice resounded inside him, and he got up and he ran. And he, he was somewhere in North Africa, and he, he found kind of shelter and refuge with the family and they helped him. And, and he couldn't get that out of his mind that his grandmother was standing there with him, this spirit woman, mm -hmm. and encouraged him to get up and, and live on and he did. So he, he had a series of events like that that told him he was different. Yes. Um, as mediums do, you do have that through your life, I think yes. the same. Um, with Albert, I think he brought that pain that he felt at the loss of his entire young family I think that honestly gave him the compassion and the drive to want to take other people out of that suffering that he had gone through. Mm. And I always say, because he was a postman, Albert, and that was his, his working, uh, his, his everyday job. And I said to him, you deliver messages on so many levels, <laughs> Albert, not only do you take them. But the one thing I said was, you know, you don't write the messages, you just deliver them. Yes. And, and it was a great way to sum him up because he could no more have told you about his gift than fly out a window. He 
he didn't he didn't totally understand it, um, as as a lot of the mediums back then did not. And I think it was out of respect. They didn't want to investigate it. Mm. They wanted it just to be natural and normal. One of the big stories in the book is the is the untold story of the mediums who were working of the, the genuine same, mediums, yeah, yeah. Second World War. Because I, I mean, I think it's only um, relatively recently that uh, we found out the big role that the code breakers played oh, yeah. in the second, winning the Second World War. Yeah. And one of the big stories in this book, as I say, is the role that mediums play. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, a lot of these mediums that, I, that I've uh, referred to and who worked during the war, they, they were, again, rumours, I can't testify that they happened, but mm. rumours that they did work with different departments of the government trying to find things out. Mm. You know, somebody has suggested to me recently that they were, several of them were asked to try to get visions and tune into what the Germans were doing to try and make this super, was it the V2 or something, yeah. this bomb. And, and they were getting information on when raids would happen and different things. Mm. So again, there's none of that that I can use in the book because it's hearsay. Yes. But it wouldn't surprise me because the real ones, the genuine ones, honestly were sought after by the highest level of, of people yes. in, in our country. But they also did this tremendous work. Oh yeah. Um, Helping people yeah. who were grieving, who were in pain, yeah. um, and uh, in that way, marvelous work for the morale of the nation. Absolutely. Helping people to see a higher meaning. Yeah. Well, I once said of, of these great ladies of, of the war that, you know, there was a medal awarded to pigeons during the war mm. for carrying messages. I said somebody should have acknowledged the messages these ladies gave and the fact that they were trying to boost morale and bring comfort and healing. And um, there's some film interest. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is. I, I told that very story to a, a lady who was a film producer who had made things like The Lord of the Rings, The Golden Compass, mm. stuff like that. And um, she immediately fell in love with these women. Mm. Um, I said uh, the, the unedited version of the book and and she got a screenwriter immediately, so we're actually going to be producing this film called Healing the Homeland, which is coming from this book. Fantastic. And, uh, and again, for me, it'll be lovely because we're going to show that there was the, the real stuff, there was frauds. Mm. And we have to highlight that genuine mediums really detest the fact that people emulate them, copy them, and then use their techniques to, to hoodwink people. Mm. And, and when that happens, I mean, it really it, it does actually if you like, it hurts you to hear that, you know, all the work you've done and you hear that somebody's gone and cheated, uh, you think, well, that's, that's a person's grief you're playing with. Mm. Better to say nothing if you don't get anything than yes. make up nonsense. So, as I say, the, we want to show that the, for every genuine medium there is, there is going to be somebody out there who's a charlatan. And, and, it, and it does lend itself to that, which is sad, because it can operate as a business where you can say, oh, you know, I do readings for whatever, I don't know what the going rate would be for mm. the private reading today, um, what, what mediums charge, but the thing is, that can become a business, and then it can become tempting that I need money, so I have to do these readings. And I think a lot of these mediums, what they do is, I call it, they have, they have kind of three readings that they can do, based on who they're reading for, <laughs> and therefore you get deaths, births and marriages in a reading. Do you know someone who died? Do you know someone who's getting married? Do you know someone yes. who's just had a baby or wants to have a baby? Yes. All of this stuff. So it's all the general stuff. Whereas the real medium, and I think mediumship was stronger during the war, and I, I believe that spiritualism had a purpose, and I think that, to this day, was the highest point of spiritualism and as a positive force. Um, because, it, you know, there's still a lot of need for mediums in the world today. Um, and, and again, reminding people that when the world gets bad, mediums get better. So, uh, that's interesting then. So if, if uh, spiritualism began to flourish uh, because of, partly because of uh, the American Civil War, and if it was at its height in the Second World War, Ooh. why is it important now when we're not... Uh, as far well, as we know. <laughs> I, I think there's a, there's a different uh, fear in the world today. Mm. 
you know, everybody can be woke up by the same fear in, in the same moment all over the world today. Mm. And something tragically happens. This is the only time this has ever happened. We can all know within moments of something bad. And we hear this constantly on our news or through mm. social, you know, social media and stuff. This disaster's happened. That disaster's happened. There's lots of things that people are now becoming afraid of. Mm. And I think when fear increases like that, so even without a war, although there are lots of little wars mm. going on in terrorism and People are actually quite scared. Yes. And I think that the role of a medium is to try and help take away that fear of this physical life. Yes. The, the message of a medium is that your loved ones live on, you will live on. Death is not the end. Yes. As I say, you can't die for the life of you. Yes. You mentioned um, earlier that, like Albert Best, you had uh, an experience in childhood which yes. set you on this road. Could you just... Well, it was, it was, uh, I mean, yeah. I've told it book, so many it times, but, but Ami was a strange name, we don't know how he got this name, it was a friend of my mother and father's, um, and I was seven when, when Ami died, and it, the way he died, he died in an accident, and my mother and father never informed us as kids. Ami lived on his own, he was kind of man who just floated around from race tracks, he was a tic-tac man that ran right. the races. Yeah. And we never even knew where Ami lived, if he had a place. He just would turn up to my mum's, get fed, things like this. But he was a lovely man, and all the kids in the street loved him when he came. If he'd won at the tracks, he'd give us old, old pennies mm. and things. And I had no knowledge that this man had died. Um, and one day I was playing in the garden. I had just uh, come through an, uh, uh, an illness. I had rheumatic fever, and I was recovering. I was in the front garden, broad daylight, and I saw Ami coming towards me from the bus terminus, where he always walked from. Mm. And in that moment, I felt rooted to the, the spot. So if I'd grown into the earth, I couldn't move. It wasn't scary, but I, was, I just felt this, wow, just there. I couldn't move towards him, but I felt almost like his love. This wonderful energy as he, as he came towards me and he was singing a little song. In this little song, he was singing, We Will Be Buried in Dalbeth. And as a seven-year-old boy, I had no idea what that meant. But he was solid to me, uh, mm. like a real person. He wasn't glowy or spirity. Or, mm. He just was on me, and, and, and I was seeing him and smiling. And then it kind of almost glided back, I would say. Didn't it? So he just disappeared out of my sight. And at that point, I felt I could run. And I ran into my mother, who was at the kitchen sink, peeling potatoes. And I remember pulling up the skirts, Mum, 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 I'm here. And he's singing a, a, a happy song, and I sang the song for mm. her. And she was furious. I, I, she actually swung around to hit me. <laughs> As children got smacked in those days. And um, she told me, you know, she started to shout at me. Yes. Why are you saying this? Get out there and play, and daddy, daddy, daddy. Yeah. My mother's reaction scared me, not the actual spiritual thing that happened. I mean, it was years later, you know, she told me that what I said to her was so kind of profound and shocking because they had just buried Ami. My mum and dad, they didn't have money, but he had no money. So they had to put him in what was called a pauper's grave. You know, we know Serbs, they're just there, no stone, no nothing. And my mum and dad were quite embarrassed by the fact that they buried this lovely man in a pauper's grave in this kind of section of the, the cemetery where just down and outs and things were buried. Mm. So that's why they, were, they didn't want to talk about it to people. Let alone when I was seven, they wouldn't have shared that with me anyway. No. But it was something that I look back on now and I think the way I saw him, he saw it like that. So he looked to you then as solid. Like I'd like be looking at you. But when, but it's not always like that, yeah. is it? When the, when the departed come to yeah. you, sometimes, and, and sometimes they appear in different ways. Yeah, that, it's, it's more of a feeling. Right. And if I'm working in this crowd, I hear a lot of the messages. But it's like an inner voice, it's not always out here. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you hear a name or something, you know, it's in here. You, you're almost, see the way you have inner dialogue with yourself? It's mm -hmm. like that, I can hear the, the voices and, and I'm just repeating them, I'm just saying it spontaneously. Mm -hmm. So, But then you, you maybe feel the presence. It'd be like if I was sitting here just now and had my eyes closed and you sat down, I would feel your, your presence here. And if I, I, I tried to describe what you look like, that's the way I would be doing it as a medium. Uh, you know, it's almost, I, I've used this before, but it's, it's like trying to describe to a person who doesn't see or feel what you do. 
Mm. It's, it, it would be like reporting a scene to a blind person. You've got to be very descriptive. Yes. You, you can't just say there's a man here. You've got to know what that man feels like, how he died, how he lived. Yes. And all of that information starts to build on you as you talk. And, you, you know, the, the, there is a whole change of the vibration around a medium when they work with it. I know what happens to me. Uh, and that vibration, I believe, is what the spirit is. Their, their vibration is connected to mine. And in that moment, I'm literally downloading. I died of a heart attack. My name's John. You know, mm. I was 79. I lived. I see a picture all of a sudden. So you've got all sorts of things happening. Mm. And you're just trying to, to record everything and say it as spontaneously and as quickly as possible. So it's, it's, it's sometimes happens to you that someone, a departed person, appears to you in that very physical form? No, that doesn't happen to me. That happened to me as a child. Right. And, and then once as a, a young adult, okay. um, I had an apparition in my bedroom, and that, that's what really started me on my journey to spiritualism. Yeah. And why, and what, and what was happening differently on those two occasions? <coughs> um, for me, what, I can now say this, I wouldn't have known at the time. Mm. Having practiced meditation and, and developing mediumship, I know that your mind goes into an altered state. So when I saw Ami, mm. I was rooted to the ground, was the one thing I could remember. But that's because I was in an altered state of consciousness, a trance state, if you like. Mm. My eyes were open, but I was seeing in a different reality. Right. Uh, so therefore, it's as much as Ami has come to me, part of me has gone out to him. And is that what um, is sometimes called uh, the light body? Yeah. That uh, is what had come out. That I would refer to that, yeah. yeah. The aura. I mean, some people see auras. I, I see auras. I see a light around you at the moment. Um, and it just depends. Sometimes you see an aura very vibrant. But that is the light body, if you like, the etheric body. Right. Um, in early spiritualism, they would have called it your etheric body. Yeah. Now, that is the part they would say would move into the spirit world. Yeah. I would say that too. That the, the etheric body moves into the spirit world. But the etheric body is not round your body, it's in your body, it's through every particle. It's a light body, a lighter version of you. Is it giving your body, it's giving your body life? It's giving it's it a life force energy. energy. Yeah, I would say that that is your life force energy. Yeah. Um, it's your electricity. Yeah. It's your power. And, and that light body in you and, and sometimes emanating from you, mm. um, which I think happens if you look at people when, when they're extremely happy or, or they're very, or they're in love. Which is a crazy altered state of consciousness, being mm. in love. That's when yes. you lose all your marbles. But you're actually in a very risen state. Yes. You feel good, and and everything about your life feels right because you're in this in love state. So that to me would be when your light body is absolutely charged. Yes. Now the opposite of that would be if somebody's suffering, say, clinical depression or or, or an illness of the body, that the, the light, if you like, goes down. So right. a bit like a dimmer switch. Is, yes. Mm, Yes. And that, if you look at somebody who's suffering with a, a depression or, or anything like that, you will see that everything about them is down. They compress, literally they depress, you know, they're, they're down here. Um, whereas to look at somebody who's feeling love or in love, they are, they are expanded. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that kind of, kind of movement of, of the light body that determines our attitude or our moods and different things. So, so... Healing, yeah. practiced by you and, yeah. and the healers you work with, it sounds as if that involves the, the light body in some way. You're doing something with the yeah. light body. I would think so. Well, again, if somebody's light has gone down, if somebody's mm. not so bright or the light is, the charge is leaving them, then as a healer, and, and you know how to lift your light body through the practices you've done, you can feel this expandedness. So basically, your energy is. is is overshadowing them, mm. and you're hoping to, if you like, jumpstart their energy. That would be a very simple way of looking at healing. I'm sure there are different types of healing that take on different things. And, but in one sense, the healer themselves encourages the light body to function again yes. around a person, so, so that they start to feel better. So, and, and I think a lot of people are given permission to heal themselves when a healer works with them. Mm. I mean, that's something I found, that you work with a patient and then all of a sudden, 
you know, they feel good. But what they've felt is this faster vibration that has been missing from their life mm. because of the thought of the illness. Because they've been doing that consciously sometimes, yeah. giving them the, Absolutely, a higher yeah. vibration. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And, the, and can people's like bodies merge, or are they always separate? Oh, yeah. I mean, I can take falling in love, for instance, or, or, or fancying someone. Mm. There, I mean, there's, there's a lot of energy you're sending out as a person. You're sending yes. out signals, but it's in the light body. Um, and, and you may, the, the same will work if, if, if your light body does not blend with another. Right. So if the aura of you and, and I are sitting here, we're sus suspicious of each other. Yeah. That's never going to happen. Um, if, if there's a trusting, feeling yeah. between people in any situation, whether they're in a bar or in a, in a workplace, then they blend and they, and they, they get on. But a lot of this is happening in the, the atmosphere around us. So our light bodies might be merging now? Probably. Because we're I would assume a, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, and also you because... You can't see it. No. Oh, well, you, you can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's yeah. times you can see that. Mm. And, and from, when I say see it, as a medium, a lot of the times you say we can see something and that's our fault for saying that, but we actually feel it. Mm. So you feel drawn to someone, right. or you're drawn in by a conversation, and that actually is you trusting. Yeah. You know, you, you're actually very trusting of another person when you, you feel yeah. that. I mean, even as we talk, there's all these blue lights appearing bubbling all around you at the moment, and I know they won't go on a camera because it's to do with yes. that light body, if you like. Yes. And, and in some ways I think of it, imagine a crystal, a cup crystal in the window. Mm. So it's just a cup crystal, but the moment the light hits it, there's going to be hues and colours and yes. all sorts of things happening. And I see that in the aura sometimes. Like you see, like there, I've seen these little flashes of blue, kind of ultraviolet, yes. kind of boom, boom, boom. And, and I think it's almost like like that that the aura is in some ways like a prism that it reflects feeling Fantastic. rather than light. So good feelings can cause the aura to have yes. flashes of purple or gold or something like that. Yes. And, and these kind of things do happen. And how physically close do people have to be for the for this touch of well, energy to take place? As limited as people can have it, there's the there are time. I mean, there's been people through Ten history, say like Padre Pio, yeah. who the wonderful monk who would who would um, astrally project out of his body. Now yes. he can, he's not leaving his body; he's connected to his body. But the light body travels, right. so therefore distance has no bearing on it if you if you don't limit yourself. So that kind of thing, you could, you could be in another country and actually still affect somebody if you know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, like a lot of the, I suppose the Tibetan monks and things or lamas, they are trained to project out of their body. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Tibet, many years ago, telepathy was a big thing. The telephone has killed it <laughs> because telepathy, they had to over a great distance. Yes. They would send messages to each other. Yes. They called it public non-reality when somebody who wasn't there would appear in a room. You know, yes. like a phantom, but they were actually felt by the people who were there. Some people say um, that the the light body um, emerges partially from the physical body during sleep. Is that true? Is think that so, true? Yeah. I mean, I've had experiences of that, and. I mean, as, as anyway, you, your brain is doing what it's doing during sleep, and it's, it's obviously fixing all the systems in the body and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And so, therefore, you go through patterns of sleep. And I think that's like levels of altered states of consciousness. You'll have semi conscious or hypnagogic states where you dream, mm -hmm. and where your dreams have, you know, maybe a, a message for you. Your subconscious yes. is, is answering questions that you've been pondering in the daytime. Yes. Or sometimes it's just a rubbish dream, it's just a yeah. bits and bobs of a day that made no sense to you. <laughs> and memories can get tagged onto that. And this is what makes people think that dreams have this special kind of supernatural mm. quality at times. And sometimes it is because you are out of your body that you you may feel the presence of a spirit. Because the spirit is, yeah. your spirit is yeah. out of your body, so another spirit can communicate more easily. Well, that part if we look at it this way, Mark, that as a medium, for me to work as a medium, that there's an expansion around me. Even as a little boy, I used to feel a vibration, and I didn't know what that was, and I would feel palpitations and, mm. and things. And now I, I learn it's not my physical heart, because I've actually done part of the scientific tests in, in the university where they monitored my body functions 
as I was going to turn all to the state. So my heart would slow down and yet I would feel this. Like my heart was pounding, but on the, on the monitor my heart would actually drop to one third of the normal heart rate. Um, my brain would be going to sleep state. And yet I was conscious, totally conscious. Yes. Because I've trained myself to do that. And um, so in, in that sense, that's what's happening. I'm out in that light body as I'm working as a medium. Now, for instance, if your father in the spirit world wanted to communicate with me, I might feel him touch me. He won't be touching the physical body, mm. but it will feel like that because his light body and my light body are now in a reality where they are solid to each other. And that's where I would say, oh, you know, your father's standing here, he's telling me, la di da. Mm. Because that's the access point. I am giving them the access to use me to, to deliver a message to you. That's, that's exactly what, how it would happen. And is that sensational? I think we all sometimes have been dreaming of, when we're asleep, of suddenly feeling as if we're falling yeah. forward. Is that connected with the... Yeah, because I, I mean, when we're doing um, development for altered states of consciousness, you do go through some of these uh, episodes where you think you're falling through the chair mm. or the floor, of you, depending on where you're meditating. And, and again, it is that sense of separation. And that's what makes death so scary to, to people because they think, what's going to happen? And, you know, and you, the old near-death experience phenomena of flying through a tunnel. Well, to me, it's nothing to do with movement of a tunnel. It's to do with quickening of a vibration. But your brain is still connected at that point and has to come up with a logical explanation for this movement. Mm. So that, and because it's going faster, 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 it, it, it resembles moving through a tunnel. Of, of light, but what, what's really happening there is you are going into your light body at, at a fast rate, and if you're not used to that, that will feel scary. Mm. That's the drop sensation. But you know, you're on the roller coaster. And, whoa. But, so what's um, happening when you're asleep then? You're well, I think that when you go to sleep and you're out of body, it's a natural thing that you, yeah. your brain has gone so low that you don't feel the separation of the light body. Right. But so is the, is the feeling of falling and coming back into the body or what? I think the feeling of falling is that, that you have awareness or conscious awareness you suddenly realize you're right. that you're out. Right. And yeah. that's scary to people. Yeah. I mean, when I was younger, I used to work with um, Tricia Robertson and Professor Roy. We would go to where people believed they were haunted. Mm. And, and the, the most popular thing was teenagers who felt that their bed was shaking. Well, of course, they were feeling that vibration. Beds yeah. don't shake. No. They really don't, you know, not even in the Enfield Porter guys or the Exorcist, a lot of that is just fantasy and drama. But the, the kid feels this experience, so their brain says, the bed's shaking, it has to come up with yeah. something. Yeah. And, and the more, when I was able to talk to them and say, no, I want, you know, we can get this tested that, to show you that you, first of all, it's not your heart rate, you're not going through a period of anxiety, it's actually this light body. Yeah. And when they got to know it, it's as if the brain accepted it and then it didn't happen anymore. Because there was a, a, an explanation that the brain could now fathom. Because without having knowledge like that and you experience a kind of paranormal thing, then you're going to think the worst, your mind goes to yes. a scary place. So even though it's not anything sinister, the first thing you do is unknown to you, therefore it's danger. Yes. And that's why a lot of people do that. So you, I mean, you know your way around your light body and you know how to work on yeah. it. Um, actually, what you were saying earlier about healing the light body um, reminded me of something which uh, uh, traditionally happened in ancient Egypt, oh, where right. the, uh, the hierophants would raise uh, the light body out of somebody lying in a tomb and then they would work on the light yeah. body before allowing it to sink back down into the body. Well, actually, there's some healers who who practice, uh, and that's what they would be doing. So to watch them, you maybe see them as if they were doing an operation mm. on, on empty space, but the, the person may actually feel the effects in the physical body. Yes. But they're, they're, you know, some, some of the healers have done that. But once again, I must point out, there's a lot of these healers who do psychic yes, surgery yes. and use pig's blood and they yes. do all this stuff, so you've got to be careful with that. Because you're a genuine one who, who does this, working on the line. Well, I mean, one of the ones I, I witnessed working was a lady called Charo Alvarez in uh, southern Spain. And she was incredible. But she would go into an altered state of consciousness and she, she would channel this entity called Maria del Mar. And whilst Maria was through, she was doing kind of some kind of stuff and mm. 
uh, with a hand, and it literally was trying to cure the person or do the healing on the person on the light body. And, and Maria, uh, not Maria, the um, Charo, I mean, she was curing a lot of people. It wasn't just a suggestive healing thing. People were going with serious illness and getting better. Yeah. Well, I'm sure she, she had a very high success rate. I'm sure not everybody can get healed. Because that can happen. Mm. Some people, there's a time for healing. But, but Charles was a great. Oh, I, I oh witnessed gosh, a gosh. little boy who was blind, and I, I carried the boy in to her office, and that boy saw after that. Mm. That, that was incredible. Mm. And, and when you tell somebody that, they think, what? Because logically that cannot happen, but it did happen. Mm. And Ben lived for another two years. She did tell his mother that she couldn't, uh, she could give him an extension to his life. But that wee boy was blind, and, and he was a dead weight. He he'd lost the use of his legs, he had brain tumours all over his head. And um, after the healing of Charo, he was running. Mm. And he went and she told him he would go back to school, he would play football. At a point though, she says the healing will stop. And the boy died two years later. But the boy had a two year extension and a quality of life. One occasion, and I have mentioned it in the book, where the lady in my street died and her two children came to fetch me. I was known as this, you know, strange guy who talks to the dead. And the lady had just died. In fact, it was her funeral the day before. And her two little kids came to fetch me, and I went over, and there was phenomena in the house like I've never seen before. Well, the carpets we, we stood on lifted, and the rapping sounds all around the wall, just like the, the Fox sisters. It was real. So much so that the neighbour from downstairs had been had come to the door and, and asked what the hell's going on. Yes. And he was standing in the living room experiencing this with us. The two kids were laughing. Yes. And, and that, all, I, all I can tell you, the feeling of love yes. in that room was incredible. It wasn't scary, this is what I mean. If you're not afraid of this stuff, none of that stuff will scare you. Yes. It certainly didn't scare me. But to see this, and I, I said to them, why wouldn't a mother want to reveal to her kids that she was still there? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't she? if yes. she could, and, and I ended up being able to, to give the message to the father about why she had come and why she was doing what she was doing, and the phenomenon stopped like that, that the message got across. So in addition to the physical phenomenon, objects moving around through space, mm -hmm. uh, you were given messages, did you also see energies, did you, could you understand? <laughs> Absolutely not, there was a, that was a, a, an individual case that's never happened again in my life, it's the one case of an actual phenomena happening physically around me and, and I have no explanation other than it was the power of the woman's love. Yes. That, that, because the joy in the room, exactly yeah, but it was just a force and, and that's what I mean, a lot of times with mediumship it gets overlooked because of the technicalities and the science and oh, you know, what causes this force, that force, the next force, mm. but it's actually love and, and it's that connectedness. So, I mean, for these little kids, I, I've always said when it's ever a mother who comes through, uh, I, I spoke to a dear friend of mine, John, and she, she put it beautifully last night, we were talking about a, a mother who has just died, and her daughter's in her 70s, and John was said, yeah, it doesn't matter what age a mother dies at, she said, because it's the most profound loss we will ever have, because that was the first heartbeat you ever heard, mm. and I thought that was so beautiful. That's beautiful. But, that's the kind of thing, it's that love for somebody so much that it does break barriers, it does, it, it, it fractures the ether, I would say, mm. and can do, because this overwhelming feeling of love, which is your light body at its most expanded, can actually do miracles that we would think. That spiritual reality uh, is kept away from us by our, our logic and our doubt and all these things. Yes. But when you, when you break through your own doubt and your own reckonings of, oh, that means reality's here, there, la -di da when you go beyond that and realise that there are other realities um, and, and they're there all the time, then you actually can feel that. I mean, at the amount of times I am so lucky to feel love as often as I do, reporting it from one side to the other. And that is the big part of, of my work as a medium, yes. is to try and animate that spirit, to, to bring them back to life for a moment so that these people can have that last conversation. Yes. Or, well, not necessarily the last, but in that context. And the healing that gets done in that moment, you, you, you can't put a price on that. No. You, you, you don't know how 
how to do anything with it other than what you do, which is bring the two worlds together for a moment. Mm. It's actually quite magic. Yes. And I suppose that leads naturally on to Dee uh, Dee Hume, mm. who I think is, I, I suspect, maybe your favourite from the way you've written up your favourite. I like too. Hume because he, his character's a nice character too, and I always think that people are decent people, I and mean, he seemed to be a decent man. I mean, there was, there was a, an episode in his life where he was coerced into marrying this older woman and things, and that's, some of the sceptics will use this against him. Right. It's nothing to do with his mediumship. Hume himself talks about it in his book and says, you know, this was something he was literally conned into doing. Yes. Um, and they were saying, no, he did it to get her money and all this stuff. But his mediumship stood the test of everything. And he, um, was, never, he was never caught cheating. No. And, what were, and why do you admire him so much? Why was he such a fantastic exemplar of mediumship, do you think? Yeah. I mean, in the book, I've actually shown that Hume, to me, was the prototype of mediumship mm. that was to follow, because he had episodes of levitation, he had um, oh, this table tilting is, was a big thing in spiritualism mm. back in the day, but, but it defied physics, and this is what William Crookes had to witness, the, all these glasses, everything on this table, this table could lift up like that and they will not move. Mm. Now, what the spirit are trying to show is there, and show a physicist, that there's another law in, in the universe that we don't know. Yes. And, and it's this kind of beyond our reckoning. So, so Hume, to me, had every gift. He had direct voice mediumship where voices would appear around him. Mm. He had parts of materialisations. People's body parts would start to materialise in ectoplasm. And he gave healing. Mm. He, he, he was a wonderful healer. And I think he was just a compassionate man. And he was most famous, I suppose, for levitation. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is the, the, the old uh, tale that he floated out of a, a window in Kensington and floated back in the other. Yes. I mean, there was a, amazing things that he could put his body into hot coals and things. They would never be burned. So, again, the spirit was showing something here to do with the science behind it, this, this kind of anti-physics, if you want to call it. I don't know what you would mm. call it, but it's, it's the opposite law of physics. So, is, is, the, is levitation to do with the light body... Again, yeah, I mean, if I had a more scientific mind, I'm sure I could describe it better, but there are episodes of I'm in a trance, okay, I'm not levitating off the ground, but my whole body becomes light. So, for instance, if, I, if my hand were like that for an hour of trance, I won't feel a thing. Whereas if you try and stand with your arms up like this, mm. it's going to hurt your shoulders, it's going to hurt your neck, but I will feel nothing because it's as if the light that's in my body has actually changed... I don't know, the, the, the structure or, or, or whatever around me. So you think you are actually lighter? You are much lighter, yeah. yeah. And I think there was, a, there was a great doctor in Glasgow years ago, Dr John Winnie, and he did tests with the mediums and the spirits when they would materialise. Uh, like he would ask permission to take a cutting of the ectoplasm mm -hmm. and have it analysed. But he also did things like he would have the mediums weighed while they were working, and they would lose weight whilst mm. working. Now that's an interesting thing. How yes. does that happen? Yes. How do you lose weight for an hour and then put it back on? But if you were in, the, in this lightened state and I reached out to touch you, what would happen then? I think it depends. On, I mean, in the old days they would say that would be dangerous to the medium. Mm. Um, and in, in some cases they say it was. Helen Duncan did have burns on her body after being raided. But, I mean, for me, no, I don't think that would affect me at all. Mm. Quite often if I'm in a trance state, then the spirit will invite people to come over and they'll give them a message directly from someone. Yes. And often they'll take the person's hand. So, but there are, there are times when the people go to reach for my hand, they feel that their hand has disappeared. Yes. It yes. hasn't physically, but they feel a sensation of lightness. Yes. It's like, oh, what yes. is that? Because they're not used to that. That's Whereas to me, that, that's quite a normal state to be in. Yeah. What's about ectoplasm? Because I think if you go on if you go on the internet, you look at ectoplasm, the first thing you see are photographs by a man called Hamilton, mm -hmm. 
Oh. A lot of those really look like fakes. Oh, they're absolutely fakes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one of the things I don't like when people write books about spiritualism and they show these silly old photographs of women with mm. bed sheets round their head appearing out of cupboards saying, look how a, a spirit coming mm. back. And a lot of people did that. Again, the, the spirit cabinet it was called, mm. and the medium would be put in the cabinet. The thinking behind it, or the philosophy behind that, was that ectoplasm could only form in complete darkness that daylight would actually not allow ectoplasm to be mm. formed. So the ectoplasm is, is the light body of the person, it's the life force energy that's being pulled. If, if ectoplasm is real, that's what it is. And then the spirit through, remember it was actually called teleplasm before mm. ectoplasm, this is the earlier term. And teleplasm was something that, that as it came out here, it would be a telepathy from the spirit that would remind itself what it looked like and they would remould themselves in their image and the, the medium's ectoplasm. Right. <laughs> so it was yeah. like a, a whole te telepathic yeah. thing, really. But it's like te telepathy in a physical form. The, the telepathy can be real. Like, it can be where well, you've got psychics in the past who could move objects with the mind. So the, the mind has a lot more uh, kind of qualities than we know. And, and I think through early spiritualism, there was a lot of experimentation with that. D.D. Hume being the protocol that they tried everything. Yes. And I think because he was open. That's yes. the thing. He didn't close his mind. He also didn't become a spiritualist. He didn't believe in it. He didn't want to be part of spiritualism. He was an individual medium. And, and I'm kind of like that today, that I, as much as I work for spiritualist churches and things like that, but I, I've never really conformed to the spiritualist religion. I'm a medium. Mm. And I think mediums have been around a heck of a lot longer than spiritualism. Mm. You know, the Joan of Arc was a medium. She yes. had to be to hear voices. Yes. You know, and so on. a lot of the prophets in the Bible and things, yes. if they did what they did, it was feats of mediumship. I think it's in the book that, that, that a famous scientist, maybe Crooks, uh, was there and investigated ectoplasm, maybe. Um, in connection with Hume, but 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 scientists did did look at yes, it, they did. and they didn't universally dismiss it. No, they didn't. Um, and Albert Best, I think, uh, had an experience with ectoplasm. He, One he which he did. Albert had an experience once with ectoplasm, and he says that he never wanted it again. And and it was nothing to do with the seance. He'd come home from his work as postman. He had a sleep on his chair. And as he was waking up, he could feel this substance coming out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. And it choked him. And he, he hated it. And he said, you know, basically, to the spirit world, never ever do that to me again. That's disgusting. He hated it. Mm -hmm. But he was coming out of a sleep and he could feel this. Mm -hmm. And he says it was just really like a horrible substance. And, and he felt bad for a day after that.